All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, uh, folks, wherever you are and wherever you happen to be uh, uh, listening to this session. I'm Lieutenant General D.T. Thompson. I'm the Vice Commander of the U.S. Space Force, and I have a, a unique opportunity today to uh, uh, talk a little to Mr. Tori Bruno. Tori is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the United Launch Alliance, uh, a, a launch provider for the Department of Defense, uh, other national security organizations, NASA, and uh, uh, commercial services as well. Uh, he, beyond just being the CEO of ULA, uh, Tori is also a long standing uh, professional in air and space. He's got, he's had a tremendous career. Um, and we're gonna use that opportunity today to talk to him about several things related to uh, his personal development, what he looks for in young professionals, uh, some of the issues and challenges and opportunities he sees today in the current environment, especially with regard to space. And then uh, we'll take a little bit of time and uh, uh, look toward the future. So, uh, Tori, welcome. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today and spend a little bit of time talking uh, with you and to the community about uh, uh, your experiences and, and your expertise. Well, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Okay, and we're going to start uh, uh, last year, the AFA and the Department of the Air Force uh, really wanted to focus on making this event a professional development opportunity. It wasn't just for um, uh, those of us to talk about uh, our companies, our capabilities, our services, but we really wanted to start talking about uh, 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 to our young professionals and help them in their development and, and use this as a development opportunity. So I'm going to start right there. Uh, sir, you have a long history of service in uh, um, in defense industry in several different ways, starting from uh, your earliest days to today. Uh, I'd like you to, if you would, think back across your career, think about a couple of the, the truly formative jobs that you had, what they were, and how they prepared you uh, to be the leader that you are today. Oh, sure. I'll probably, I'll probably share two events. But before I do, I just want to take a moment and congratulate you, sir, on your nomination for your four star. Big news. And uh, thanks to the AFA and General Wright for making all of this happen. And, you know, not just giving up in COVID, but persevering through and showing that we can do what needs to be done. Um, I think I'm going to start with something that happened very early in my career. So I was just kind of a kid engineer. I was working for Lockheed and uh, it was in the middle of the Cold War and we were developing the D-5 Trident II submarine launch ballistic missile. So part of our country's triad, strategic triad that continues to keep us safe. And it was a big deal. The Russians were 10 feet tall in those days and we were terrified of them. And we uh, got this rocket developed and the first time we launched it out of a submarine, it did a quick cartwheel and exploded. And the next day, every man, woman, and child in my company and my customer were working on that problem. And it was thought to be in a certain part of the rocket, not my part. I was just some kid. And so I was looking at my data. We're all looking at their data. It's about two days in, and we had no clue what had happened. And late in the afternoon, I thought I figured it out. And I stayed basically all night and convinced myself I had the answer and pulled together a bunch of data so I could prove it. I went home, got about an hour of sleep, came back to the office for our big 0630 in the morning uh, group thing where we all got together in a giant auditorium to report on what we had learned the prior day. I went in to see my boss first. I said, hey boss, I, I figured it out. I know what happened. And he said, yeah, all right, kid. I said, no, let me show you. He goes, all right, all right. So I showed him my stuff. And he said, crap, you figured it out. Now, in those days, managers were a lot gruffer. So, that, I mean, that's literally what he said. <laughs> you know. So, about 15 minutes later, I was standing in front of that room with 500 people, and I was showing my stuff. And that is actually what happened. And that was a, an important kind of moment in my career. I got sent off with a Tiger team to go design a fix. And sir, I've been doing Tiger teams ever since. I always had a day job, but I was always being sent to work on something. And when I kind of went into management, it was the same thing. I, I'd be given a department that was struggling or a program that was failing or a company that was on the brink. And what I learned from that is that even in that big auditorium, you know, the most respected person there was our flag. 
but the most important person in the room at any moment of time was the guy who had the answer. And that's kind of a key thing in our world. And maybe I'll pick one other event that was really important to me because it taught me another thing that was a key truth about our industry and the kind of work we do. A few years later, another Tiger team, uh, the U.S. was after Omar Gaddafi. He was running around the desert. He knew exactly how long our cycle time was to find him, put a strike package together and go after him. And he would move just short of that. And so he was untouchable and we wanted to touch him because he was doing bad things, especially in Europe. You'll probably remember that, sir. And we were working on a hypersonic guided weapon that could reach out and say hello in about 30 minutes. And the team that was working it, they were great people, but they blew up the last of their hardware and set their test stand on fire. And so I got sent in to go help them out of the ditch. And in a handful of weeks, uh, these five or six people, because they were just a bunch of mad scientists in a laboratory, pulled that whole thing together and got it working and flight demonstrated it. And uh, along with all the other things the U.S. was doing, I think maybe put uh, a little bit of fear and realism into a bad actor who needed to behave better. And what I learned from that is those five people who were absolutely dedicated and motivated to make a difference could move heaven and earth and solve an impossible problem. So as you look at uh, young professionals out there, um, I assume that's what you're looking for. You're looking for those with passion, motivation and have the answer. Is there, is there something else you're looking for when you see, I mean, clearly you lead a large organization with a whole host of uh, individuals, but when you look at young engineers, young program managers, um, do you look for that in them? What else do you look for for those that you think will set themselves apart in the future? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. I mean, the first thing is what you said. I'm looking for people who have a passion for our mission area. We're going to ask a lot of these people. We're going to ask them to work hard, to stretch themselves, to be challenged. So they have to be committed. I don't want someone who thinks this is just a job or has something that uh, they don't believe in relative to what we're doing. They've got to be committed and really care about this. Then I'm looking for people who just have a willingness to learn and a proactive motivation to go out there and find out everything they can, learn from the senior people on the team, learn from industries that aren't even related to ours, read up, be fearless about it. Don't say, well, I can't, have, I can't do that assignment, sir, because they didn't teach me that in school. Jump in there and figure it out and use your resources and bring fresh ideas to the table. That's one of the most powerful things about having young professionals enter the workforce is that, that excitement, that enthusiasm, but also that new point of view. Okay, uh, very good, thanks. And, and so, um, so those, ex those experiences were formative for you and, and you, know, you, you talk about going out and reading and learning new things. So what have you done over the years personally, whether it was of your own design or, or as part of a, 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 a professional development program in the, in the various organizations you worked in, what did you do to continue to develop yourself and prepare yourself for the future through the years um, oh, as, yeah. as you move forward? Sure. So, you know, probably two buckets of things, you know, the companies that I've worked for have been great about investing in their people. So I've been to all kinds of programs. I've been to Harvard. I've been to the Defense Acquisition University. So they've invested a great deal in my formal training. Uh, but also, I've just had, you know, a, an intellectual curiosity that has, you know, driven me to, you know, to read books and read technical papers and to look into you know, management theories and other things unrelated to my work just to keep my intellectual stimulation going. But you know, our, our, our profession, sir, is, is about a lifelong commitment to learning. You're just beginning when you come out of school. At the mere tip of the iceberg of your professional development is there when you graduate. It's all on you after that. Okay. Very good. And, and so another thing I'm sure you learned through the years, and especially you need to have now, is the ability to manage your time. And, and obviously, there's no doubt that you have folks who help do that. 
but what you you know you could work full you could work 24 hours a day seven days a week and still not do everything that really you ought to do as a ceo talk about your approach and your technique for making sure you're spending your time on the things you should spend your time on and then after that perhaps um, uh, even when you're doing that, you're still going to, it's going to be physically and mentally and emotionally wearing. So talk first about how you make sure you're focused on the right things with your time and how you keep yourself fresh, maybe physically and, and mentally and emotionally. Oh, sure. And you know that you've hit on it exactly. And I know in, in your career, you understand this very well, 24, seven, 365 kind of job. You are never disconnected and there is an infinite demand signal on your time. So you can't let it own you. You have to be strategic about how you apply your time and attention because that is a finite resource, just like every other resource we manage in our professional life. And so I am very deliberate about what is happening in my company and my external commitments at any moment in time. And I think about how I will proportion my time. Now the the big enabler after that is to have great people on your staff who are enabled to act uh, on your behalf by partly by their competency because they're great people, but also because you've been a consistent leader in a simple and clear communicator so that everybody has the same strategy and mission goals in mind so that they can go forth and do on their own without you doing their job for them. Uh, you know, in terms of the other part, how do you, you know, how do you maintain your mental and physical health in a, you know, in a role like that? You know, for me, it, uh, it starts with, you know, being deliberate and planning around my family. You know, I think one of the mistakes that people make early in their leadership career is they, they either forget about their family and they put it off for later and, and you know, sir, there is no later, or they imagine it'll fit into their priorities and they try and go forward tactically. And there's always something that crushes that. So I plan it, I manage it. So I treat it like any other of my strategic responsibilities. It has a place on the calendar. There are things that will get done. I mean, it sounds a little cold and analytical, but if you don't manage it, your, uh, your commitments will manage you and your family will end up not you know, not being treated fairly. And then, you know, there's an intellectual piece. Um, it's important to do things that are not work from time to time. And I have a, I have a passion for history. It may sound a little weird, but I've, for a rocket scientist, but I've written a couple of books on medieval history, kind of in my spare time, just to detach. And then finally, you know, if, if I'm home on the ranch here in Colorado, uh, I am on my horse and that's kind of how I stay fit. <laughs> very good, very good, thank you. Okay, let's, now let's, uh, um, we're gonna turn the lens a little bit here. We're still gonna talk about, uh, we're still talking to young professionals, um, but uh, clearly over your career, you have had, you know, you've worked closely, no, no question with dozens and, and perhaps hundreds of government officials, whether they're military members or government civilians in, in a whole host of organizations. Um, we routinely get asked and opine about our relationship with industry and, and, and some of those things. What I would like you to do, if you would, um, obviously no names here, but think about uh, a couple of those uh, government uh, um, uh, uh, employees that you worked with, whether they're military, uniformed, or civilian. Um, Give me examples of those government employees who you thought were effective, who served well, and who you worked well with, and some of the qualities and characteristics they had that made them especially effective. And then I'm going to turn it around and ask you to think about a few that perhaps weren't as effective and the, the qualities and, and characteristics to avoid, perhaps, from our perspective as we work with you all in the industry. Sure. Well, you know, I got to start by saying one of the things that is just been wonderful about my experience in our industry is the quality of people that I get to work with and for as my customers. Um, you know, I talked about being committed to a mission and how important that is. Uh, you get that as, a, you know, basically cost of entry when you, when you work on with the DOD, everybody there cares about what they're doing and it's a wonderful experience. The best customers I have had, have really seen 
industry as their partner. It's not an adversarial relationship. It's not a greedy contractor out there making money. They understand that this, these missions get done together and they bring the leadership that turns that into a really a transparent two-way relationship where both parties are valued and they establish common goals so we can be a team because you can't be a team if you don't have common goals and common definitions of when you succeeded and failed. And of course, I think the best that I've worked with have done all that while at the same time setting a very high standard for us. Uh, you know, you don't have to accept uh, second best or poor performance to be a partner or to be a leader. You can still hold industry to a very, very high standard and make us accountable while at the same time, you know, bringing us together to do that. And maybe the last thing I'll, I'll touch on for those really outstanding leaders that I think back on is integrity. Um, you know, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, sir, that that is so important when people are going to work together on something that is hard. They got to trust each other. They have to trust each other's honesty and motivation. And by gosh, if you lose that, it is so easy to lose. You can never get it back. So, you know, that's probably maybe the top thing. Now, I've had one or two that were less than stellar, <laughs> only because of how long I've been doing this. Um, and maybe the, you know, the couple that, that pop into mind, the first one I would say just had a, a flawed idea about leadership. And, and the organization this person ran was really based not on high standards or a sense of urgency, but on fear. Everybody was afraid of this leader. And so there was a lot of hurrying for hurry's sake. There was a lot of scurrying about to bring this person news the first to be the first one to bring it, whether it was right or accurate or <laughs> helpful. Um, so people make mistakes and their judgment is flawed when they're afraid of their leader. And uh, it, you know, it led to, it led to poor outcomes and it was unfortunate. Um, this leader also hid bad news, hid it from their partners in industry, hid it from their superiors. And that's probably the worst thing you can do. You can't fix it if you don't know it's in trouble. And, it, and the earlier you find out, you know, the more range partial you have to get it corrected. So that, that's just a killer and something that should never be tolerated. All right. Okay, last, uh, uh, last question in this section, um, somewhat related to our young professionals, but uh, related to us in the Space Force as well. One of the, one of the visions that, uh, that our boss, uh, General Jay Raymond, has cast for us is, is, I won't necessarily say a different relationship with industry, but perhaps the ability for individuals, professionals to flow back and forth more easily between working in the Space Force and working in industry to help the flow of information, to help the expertise, and in fact, to help us in terms of maintaining our freshness and our, our, our expertise. Um, your thoughts on uh, uh, whether that's a good idea and then um, how we might accomplish something like that, because that's certainly, it happens at some level, it happens uh, now and again, but but uh, to set it up as a truly uh, functioning uh, activity is is probably easier said than done. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I do. Well, first off, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, one of the things that you know is difficult in these relationships where we're trying to be a team and serve this mission together is that our processes and our procedures, and in some cases you know, how we're measured as individuals or teams in our respective corners are very, very different. And so when you're in industry, you, you're working away and then you're getting questions or requests for products from your customer and you have no idea why. It makes no sense to you. And you know, why are they asking for that? There's important work to do. And it's confusing and it's distracting. And yet, in my experience, you guys never ask us for something you don't need. <laughs> and so there's a very good reason. We just don't know what it is. And it probably works both ways, I suspect, as well. And so this is a great opportunity for us to learn about each other's world and how it works, and maybe even occasionally anticipate those requests before they're asked or before they're even urgent. 
so that we can be more efficient together. So I love the idea. Um, in terms of how to do it, I, I think your question contains some of the answer. It's got to be structured. It can't just be a notion that, well, people will maybe make career choices to go back and forth, or we'll do it somehow in an odd ad hoc basis. Uh, we'll have to be deliberate about it. It'll be a structured program in order to be successful. Um, you know, I look to the education with industry, the EWE program that the Air Force has is a good model. We love our EWEs. You guys send us two, three, four a year, and uh, they spend a year with us doing various jobs in our company, real jobs. They're not some kind of year long tour of facilities or something like that. When I get an EWE, I put them to work. And so they learn about our company, they learn about the industry, they make real contributions. They never separate from the service because that's important. You can't get a wide participation if we're gonna expect people to sever their ties with what they consider their primary career path. So whether it's six month tours, 12, 18, they come, they do this thing, they take that knowledge back and share it. What we lack, of course, even in a program like that is there's no industry counterpart. So we, we need people from industry coming to your world to do a real job, just like we want the Air Force personnel and Space Force personnel to do a real, real task that matters so they're fully engaged and then come back and also not sever from their companies. So more like a reserve kind of thing, you know, for those of our employees that are reservists. Go do a job, come back and bring the knowledge. That would be my suggestion. Okay. Very good. We'll look forward to working with you as we continue to evolve that concept and hopefully turn it into reality. Okay. So in the second part of our chat, why don't we, we'll move now to, let's call it uh, the current environment and some of the organizational challenges and, and, and things that you all face um, certainly, I would say uh, we're faced with what may be a, a sea state change in the space sector. You know, we'll, we'll set COVID aside for a minute. I'll come back and ask you perhaps about COVID in a few minutes. But when you think about um, uh, the, 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 I'll call it the, the burgeoning commercial sector, you know, the move toward proliferated constellations, um, uh, the fact that more and more entities, whether they're uh, companies or international organizations or countries are moving into space, it's becoming a different environment. Uh, if you would talk to me about what ULA and perhaps other U.S. companies are doing and should be doing, whether it's on the defense side, the commercial side, the civil side, to stay uh, rele uh, relevant and competitive in today's environment. Yeah, sure. You know, the first thing you got to do is realize that the environment is not static. Change is rapid and it's going to be here to stay for quite some time. And that means you have to move or die. It's pretty much that simple if you're going to stay relevant. And, you know, our, I think our experience is, uh, is a great commentary on this. You know, what we had to do uh, is one of those things that says easy when you sit back dispassionately in our particular case, which will not be entirely dissimilar. I could look at our company and say, okay, we've been a sole source provider, really almost an extension of the Air Force for the first eight or nine years of our existence. And now good news, the space industry, launch industry has matured and expanded. Country needs that at a time of challenge, but we're not suited for that. So we have to change. And what we did wasn't that complicated. You know, we, I reorganized our company and reduced our executives so we could be flatter and more agile. I redesigned my supply chain so it was smaller and more strategic with real partnerships. Um, I retired rockets. I had an overly complicated stable of rockets, over 41 configurations, some of which I was maintaining ready to go and yet had never been asked for. <laughs> That's pretty expensive. And then, you know, the last, second to last perhaps, and the hardest thing is to right size our workforce. We actually reduced our headcount by about 30% while introducing a new rocket uh, and not breaking our culture, our mission success focus, and our commitment to serving the country's needs uh, and flying another 60 perfect missions through all of that turmoil and shakeup. And it, you know, these are pretty straightforward things you'd find in any business book, but the fact is about 90% of companies that attempt a transformation like that fail and go broke and go bust. 
And so I'm, I'm pretty proud that my people took us through that. And as, you know, as evidence, you know, here we are having recently won a major competition in our world and we get to continue serving the country. So it can be done. And it took me a minute to describe it, but I got to tell you, sir, this was extraordinarily hard and it took a lot of close management and just plain a lot of fortitude because there are a million forces that will want to push a leader off of the pretty clear things that have to be done because all of them are really, really difficult. And it just, it takes real determination and a clear vision to see your way through it. And all of our organizations, both in the military, the government, and uh, in industry, I think can do this. And just remember, this is what our country needs us to do. It's going to be hard, and you got to stick it out. So, and I think that does uh, lead into a, a, the next question quite nicely. Is you know, you've heard, uh, you know, and you've answered many times the the criticism that uh, our acquisition processes take too long. It takes too long to build and field these capabilities. They're too expensive. We're not keeping up with the pace of our adversaries, in this case, primarily China. Um, it sounds like at some level you agree with that criticism, but if you would talk about that a little bit, about that criticism and, and, and what we can and should be doing to change it, perhaps in addition to what you've laid out already. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think that there's a couple of things that enable us to go faster, but then I'm going to come back to what, what fast really means in our world. So, you know, we're, we're in this great moment in time in our space industry where there are so many uh, new players and new opportunities and new technologies. And so that's an opportunity for the mission space, for the government to be connected to all of that and harvest it and bring it into platforms quickly where we need it. Uh, and there are new engineering tools and scientific tools that are available today as I'm designing my new rocket that I did not have on the last 36 rockets I designed over the years that allow us to go a lot faster and have a lot higher performance. So we got to use all of that and embrace it. And that will allow us to catch up and maintain the pace. Well, we're really ahead of them already, but to maintain that lead. But you got to be realistic. Space is really difficult. It is completely unforgiving. And the things and the risks that people are willing to take for commercial products are not always going to be risks and levels of reliability that we can accept when someone's life depends on our solution. So we can go faster, but if we think we're gonna turn a product from idea to being on the shelf in 18 months, like somebody does in the Silicon Valley, we're gonna have a lot of products that won't serve the need. So we, we, we wanna take what is there, but we need to adapt it to our environment at the same time so that we're doing the right thing. I'd also suggest that as we look at these adversaries who are nipping at our heels, and although in space we are, you know, no one touches us in space, we're the world leader but certain applications we have not paid attention to. We've not put a lot of investment into either offensive or defensive systems in space where our, lead, where our competitors have. So you might say there are niches where they're getting ahead. We gotta take big steps. I mean, it's not take a million steps really fast. It's look at that and make a big bold move, a big architecture shift that moves that goalpost so far away they can't find it anymore. That's how we'll be ahead of them. Okay, and and um, and I think another thing that uh, China has been doing to to catch up and move forward quickly is you look at what they're doing with the uh, theft of our intellectual property and the exfiltration of sensitive data on systems and and uh, working their way into our supply chains. What are what are you all doing about that? What do you think some other things perhaps we as a integrated sector ought to be doing to work that problem. Yeah, boy, gosh, sir. And you know, I, you know, the government is really concerned about this and there is a sort of constant flow of new requirements, particularly in cyber on each new contract. But I have to tell you, it is just shocking in terms of the scale and ubiquity of this threat and this effort on the part of China to not only gain access to intellectual property through traditional means, you know, hacking or espionage, but through infiltration of the supply chain. You know, we had a wake up call, I would say just a few months ago, maybe a year ago now, where 
you know, we're developing our new rocket and we've got tooling in our factory and we've got a supplier that provides software that drives the tooling. These are all domestic sources. And we discovered almost by accident that a key element in that software chain, a key company, had been purchased by a company owned in China. And when we followed up with the FBI and the counterintelligence activity that they provide, which is first rate, we realized, yeah, this is not an actor we need to have inside our factory. And so we have had to go forward, you know, in partnership with the government, but we can't afford to wait for them either. And so we went out and kind of put an architecture together of first things is to go to the supply chain and ask them to certify their ownership. Are you a domestic company or not? Who are your shareholders? Uh, for those of you who are not up to snuff, you got to fix it. If you can't fix it, we're going to replace you. If we can't replace you, we're going to have to figure out how to break up the work into little bitty pieces so you don't know what you're working on and you're not getting access to our intellectual property. And I had to actually hire a firm. There are companies who specialize in this, who tunnel through all of my supply chain and through all the shell companies and indirect ownership and all the, the fog and in methods that, uh, that, that China uses to, to infiltrate these companies without being detected, to find them for me. And I have to do that literally every quarter. It's a new picture. This is a really dynamic environment. And so we're off doing it, but it would be, you know, I think serving us well if the government could help us with this and put uh, a framework in place that helps us find these guys, uh, potentially legislation that makes it a lot harder for China to either acquire U.S. companies, invest in U.S. supply chains, and even when they're, sir, when they're not, even when they're not buying the company, when you think you're in Silicon Valley with venture capitalists getting investment into startups or into new technologies, when you tunnel through those guys, you find out there's a lot of Chinese money in San Francisco. And that is how they get access and influence in that chain. All of that's got to be made legally much more difficult so that it's easier for everyone to act. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving to, uh, um, let's move to the commercial sector uh, 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 for a few moments. As I, as I talked about, it's obviously, it's burgeoning. It's a, it's a tremendous new potential opportunity. And um, uh, uh here we are in the, in the Space Force looking at what a design for today and the future ought to look like. And it certainly should include some of the elements that we see emerging in the commercial sector. If you would talk about your perspective on some of the opportunities that exist for us to leverage that sector. And if you've got a caution, what would that be? Yeah, well, I think it is a great opportunity. There is so much going on right now and so much rapidity with technology that could potentially be applied. And I think really the key is for the government, for the Air Force, and for the Space Force to have partnerships with these startup companies and smaller companies that have technologies that we could imagine could be applied so that we could get an understanding of those and begin to figure out how to fit them into our architectures for our new systems. The caution I would have is I'm not the first person to say something like this or try it, and what we've seen in the recent you know, decade or so where this has been attempted is that there's a phase in the life cycle of bringing that technology into a DOD platform where many of them just die. We call it the valley of death. It's a great idea. We did some you know, crater with them and it, we could clearly see the application. This ought to be wonderful. Let's see if we can now bring it up to the standard that we need in our systems and it doesn't make it across. And often it's because of disconnects and what these companies need for intellectual property protection, uh, where the government is looking for something they can't do. They can't give that and still maintain their investors. Or perhaps it's because they don't understand the requirements for operational systems and they get themselves stuck down a dirt road and they literally impale themselves on some key requirement they just can't solve. Where I have seen it succeed is where the government customer pairs them together with a more traditional company. 
and kind of a mentor relationship where it's, you know, your job, big prime or small prime, because you've got the platform. I want this thing. Your mission is to get this technology into our platform. And you're going to work with that company because you understand all of these issues around, you know, business profiles and IP, and you're going to bring them across as their mentor and get them on the other side of that valley of death. So th that would be what I would recommend as a technique to really try and make the most out of harvesting these new technologies and the speed it can bring us. And don't feel like you have to do it all on your own. You know, I think sometimes it's tempting for DOD to go out and grab these small innovative companies and try and turn this into a platform and, you know, be frustrated and not pay attention to their traditional players instead of tasking them. You get in there and you help me do this. Lean on us, <laughs> pressure us a little bit. Okay, all right. And then uh, uh, lastly, talking, let's say the current environment, uh, now overlay on top of all that we just discussed, uh, the coronavirus and, and the impact it's already had and the fact we don't really exactly know uh, what the near future and even perhaps the far term future is gonna look like. How about talking a little bit about what your experience, what the company's experience has been, how you've adapted and, 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 and maybe some challenges you see going forward as we deal with coronavirus. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there were probably two big lessons for me coming through that. The first was you just can't buy time. You know, we, we were fortunate. We got on this sort of early and aggressively. And as you know, as, as you know, this was an exponential curve. And just the simple math of that is that if you wait and try and react when you're behind the curve, you'll never catch up. So that was the first big lesson. The second one was, and I, I continue to be surprised at how much energy this takes. You know, the, the strategy was simple, right? Keep your people safe, slow the spread and support the missions. And in our case, that meant fly the manifest and get the new rocket developed. So not a very complicated strategy, but you know, I still meet every single day with my senior staff. This started in March when we realized this was getting away from the country and we had to get in front of it. You know, we do all the stuff that everybody does, you know, the hourly disinfecting and the maximum telework and deep cleaning and contact tracing and all of that. But there is no playbook for a global pandemic. It's only the fourth one in human history. And so every single day, there's something we had to deal with, the new state and local regulation or a new challenge we hadn't anticipated in the factory because you know, the desk and board guys can telework, but you can't build a rocket in your basement or your kitchen. <laughs> You've got to have them at work. And so they got to be spread out and they got to have PPE. And so it, it's just close combat management every single day. And you have to make that commitment and do it. You can't delegate it to somebody else. You got to be in front of it. So we've been able to to fly the manifest and keep our programs on track. We haven't missed any major milestones. So I'm incredibly proud of my people because it takes courage to work in that environment and pleased that we got on it early enough to be effective and could pull our weight. I also have to hand it to, you know, the secretary and Dr. Roper, you know, they were leading from the front on this whole thing. Uh, Will Roper would call me at, at the beginning of this about once a week. How you doing? What do you need? How can the government support you? And uh, there weren't very many things I asked for. I asked for, you know, the letter, send me a letter because I'm trying to manage my supply chain. I'm essential, but they don't believe they are. So let me be able to explain to them they are. But I don't need any relief on milestones. You know, I don't need any money. You know, go apply your attention to people who are in worse shape than we are. We're going to pull our weight. And so they were great the entire time. Uh, the Air Force has been great. The Space Force has been awesome. Uh, I just can't say enough. Okay, very good. All right, I'm gonna ask you, uh, uh, we're gonna close with just a couple of questions about the future. But uh, before we do, just a very brief interlude if I can. I, you know, I remember as a young officer looking at, you know, the old officers and the, and the senior leaders in industry and, and you, you forget that you know they're human beings too and they have interests and passions and, and things that they care about beyond the job that they do. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you just one round of questions. I'm gonna give you a couple options and ask you to pick them. And that way the audience gets a little, to know a little bit more about Tori Bruno, the man and, and, and what, he, what makes him tick, okay? 
Okay. All right. Uh, so, football, basketball, or baseball? Bull riding. Oh. <laughs> okay. This may not go very well. Golf or tennis? <laughs> Uh, I like to watch tennis. Tennis. Running or biking? Uh, biking. Hunting or fishing? Hunting. Beer or wine? Beer. Domestic or imported? Oh, domestic. <laughs> Scotch or bourbon? Bourbon. I think I know the answer to the next one. Water skiing or snow skiing? <laughs> I like to be in the lodge at the ski resort. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the perfect place for it. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Facebook or Twitter? Twitter. Ooh. Classical, jazz, or rock and roll? Rock and roll all the way. All right. And then uh, how about rap or hip hop? Hip hop. Okay. All right. Last one. And this refers to your earlier comment. Now define warrior monasticism in 10 words or less. Ten words. All right. A selfless devotion to a mission greater than oneself. Sounds like it works in, in the 21st century as well, doesn't it? I think so. Okay. All right. I had a second round, but but uh, we're running a little long, so I'm going to skip that one, and, and, and let's finish, if we can, uh, talking about the future. Okay. So, so let's go far out in the future. Let's say 50 years, which is an eternity, especially in this, this day and age technology. Um, if you would talk about what you think the national security space sector might look in, like in 50 years, and then maybe what should the space force look like? That's been a, that's been a hot and heavy discussion in, in some of the, the pundit sections, but tell me what national security space will look like in 50 years and maybe what the space force should look like. Yeah, so I think in 50 years, it's, it's leapfrogged over what we're focused on right now, which is security in Earth orbit, into an environment where we require security in cislunar space. Because with that vast space between Earth and the moon, that is a stealthy high ground that gives an adversary asset, access to everything we have in Earth orbit and ultimately on the surface of the Earth. And in 50 years, we're going to have a thriving cislunar economy, which means we will have economic and geopolitical interests on the moon and the space in between that the Space Force has to secure and guarantee, not unlike the first mission of the U.S. Navy after the revolution, which was really about protecting U.S. commerce. Okay, very good. Now, how about, you know, your your career as a rocket scientist, right? Tell me specifically what launch looks like in 50 years. Well, launch is going to be different. In 50 years, uh, launch vehicles that take off from the Earth will never go past LEO. We will drop those payloads off just orbital, and there will be a space transportation system of assets that stay in space that will pick them up and move them through Earth orbit and through cis-lunar space. So that Earth to Leo is a commodity, and uh, that train doesn't go any further than that. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, and then, and then the last question about the future. We started talking to uh, young professionals of all stripes. Um, those young professionals today who you're training and mentoring and preparing are going to be the leaders of tomorrow who will be training those professionals who will be the leaders in 50 years. So you're training the generation that will train the generation. Do you think a lot of what you know, what you did and how you prepared yourself will serve them well, or will we need to train, will they need to change the way we develop, prepare and, and create the leaders and the Tory Brunos of the future, not just the, the CEOs, but the, but the young Tory Brunos. What do you think about that in the next 50 years? Well, I, I think the journey in the North star is timeless. Right. So uh, the values that we have today, our patriotism, our commitment to our mission, our belief that, uh, that our country has provided the greatest contribution to human dignity in the history of the world, those are timeless. Those are the values that we will serve us well now and into the future. And the journey you take in terms of of having a commitment and being fearless and taking on assignments and challenges and knowing that you are there to contribute to your teammates, that's timeless. What will change are the things they learn, the technologies they use, perhaps how they learn those technologies. 
but our values in, in how we commit ourselves to our modern warrior monasticism, that's timeless. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'd like to close with a, a, a just a few thoughts, but before I do, I wanna give you one last opportunity. You know, I've asked a lot of questions here over the, the 45 minute session or so, but there's gotta be one question that I should have asked or you wish I would have asked. How about, uh, is, is, is your last statement, ask the question I should have asked and then go ahead and answer it for me. Yeah, so, you know, I, I do get asked this one from time to time and it's how do I feel about the future of our country and how we use space and am I optimistic about where all of this is going and the Space Force included in all of that? And I have to say, I am unbelievably optimistic about our future. This is yet another challenge that our country is facing. Other people, other adversaries bringing warfare to space, I have absolutely no doubt that we will deter aggression there. We will be successful in doing so. We have the greatest industry in the world. We have the most dedicated and professional military that anyone could ever hope to have. And I have no doubt that we will prevail in this sort of brewing competition. Okay, thank you very much. Let, so let me, I'm gonna close now uh, and say a couple of things if I can. First is uh, uh, to General uh, Wright and AFA and the entire staff, I wanna, uh, as you started with, I'd like to thank them for continuing this, this valuable uh, um, uh, activity in this event, even in the current environment. Uh, and for the work they do for all of us year in and year out, uh, providing advocacy and support and education and all the things that they do. Um, I really appreciate uh, 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 General Wright and his leadership and AFA. But the last thing I would like to say is, and you hinted at it a little bit uh, early on in your remarks, you know, we, we walk around, the, the military members of the national security team are often in public in, in, uh, in uniform and have the opportunity and, and enjoy the tremendous support of the American people and the direct gratitude and thanks. You know, routinely, uh, always, any of us out in uniform, uh, uh, you know, the average American will come up, they'll thank us for their service and they're truly appreciative of what we do. Um, what I'd like to do here is, uh, you know, we recognize that, that that national security team and those responsible for the defense of the nation goes well beyond that. It extends to uh, those in government service who don't wear a uniform and absolutely are industry partners. And uh, uh, for you, uh, Tori, personally in your career, but also for the hundreds of the thousands of Americans in the industry that, that uh, you represent, I'd like to close by saying to you and all of them, thank you for your service as well. Uh, we greatly appreciate it and we benefit from it every day. So, so thanks for your time today. Thanks for sharing a lot of your insight with the, the audience and with me personally and, and especially for you and the hundreds of thousands like you. Thanks for your service and your support to national security as well. Well, thank you. I'm touched, sir. Thank you.